The new coronavirus is, and the ongoing pandemic is a global crisis um, that is unprecedented in recent history. It is affects many countries or uh, basically every country in the world and many citizens, and it affects all areas um, in public and private life, as we can see right now. However, it is just the most recent um, in a set of the number of crises, perhaps the most global one in recent history, but it fits into a widespread assumption that there's increasing uh, that there's an increasing frequency and increase in the number of devastating crises. So think of um, the terrorist attacks on September 11th, of those in Paris, Brussels, or Berlin. Think of the earthquakes in Haiti or Nepal, the triple disaster in Fukushima, the global financial crisis, the euro crisis, or perhaps the migration crisis in 2015. That is just to name a few crises that, however, have stuck in the minds of many. If Empirically correct or not, there is this widespread assumption that there are more crises and that they are more devastating and that more crisis management is actually needed. As researchers, um, we also see at the same time, however, that there is this widespread assumption that crises do increase in number uh, and intensity. But we also see that particularly in the global north, we are less and less willing uh, uh, to accept or tolerate crisis. We, have, we want to be safe, we want to be secure, and we have realized that many crises can at least be mitigated or perhaps even prevented from happening in the first place through human action. So there's, there are very high demands and expectations as to what crisis management and the policies actually are supposed to deliver and are supposed to achieve. So these high demands in crisis situations, they are addressed with politicians, particularly to with the government. Right? There are authorities in place in essentially every system, uh, every country in the world um, to manage crisis. So we have crisis management systems everywhere. They look rather different, but they are in place in essentially every country in, in the world. And what people expect from governments then to do is to keep the, to control the situation, to keep it under control or to regain control and to mitigate harm and damage and losses as good as possible, um, so to speak, and to prevent also, of course, further harm and damage um, from happening. At the same time, uh, this intensity maybe also contributes or makes crisis management ultimately highly political. Politicians are assessed as either good or bad uh, crisis managers, it's not so easy to say what makes a politician a good or bad crisis manager or crisis leader. However, we can we ask or we wonder ourselves, do they succeed in preventing or mitigating the harm? Do they succeed in reducing the number of potential losses? Do they find appropriate answers? Are they able to communicate their answers? Are they able to find consensus and support for what they for their policy um, responses? So Crisis management and the success or how we evaluate and assess crisis management and the success of crisis management depends on the one hand on what you could call objective measures. Is there a reduction of harm and losses? But on the other hand, it also depends on cultural and political interpretations of a situation. So what is considered an appropriate response also depends on the political and administrative culture, on established state society, relations and past crisis experience. And most often, those answers and policy responses are somewhat controversial and contested because of conflicting interests, diverse political preference and ideologies. This is what makes crisis management an ultimately very political task, in particular in a concrete crisis response situation. A crisis essentially is about threat, uncertainty, and high time pressure. Very often, when a crisis unfolds, we don't know what happens and how it will unfold. Um, we don't, it's difficult to really assess the situation. Um, we have no data or the data is uncertain and the intensity and the urgency is also puts us under, or the crisis leaders, crisis managers under additional um, pressure. And the first, or what a crisis, what is essential to a crisis is that it's a threat that, that or a hazard that threatens an important 
system or structure um, under such a pressure that we that we have reasons to assume that it uh, cannot uh, that it will not function anymore or that it will be interrupted or it's threatened in their further existence and continuity. We've always had crisis and disasters. Right? So crisis management and research in crisis management also often speaks interchangeably of crisis and disasters. So we've always had earthquakes, volcanoes uh, that were erupting, um, but also pandemics. But what is particular about the crisis that we've seen over the last two decades, roughly speaking, is that they are increasingly transboundary. So they cross-cut the boundaries of the nation state. They spread rapidly. And that is, of course, related to the interconnectedness of contemporary society. So socialization, but also globalization, but also digitalization, technological change makes uh, or enables uh, certain threats to spread way more rapidly than they used to. This would also, in turn, require coordinated responses, transboundary crisis management, but that is particularly difficult. Crisis management is challenging in the first place, and when it's supposed to, 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 to travel to, uh, across the borders of nation state, that is, what makes it, that is particularly difficult um, because we have all kinds of economic and power differentials in place, different types of crisis interpretation, different sets of data and information, different state traditions on how to respond, and different institutional systems that are enacted. And coordinating this is a major task, which is hugely challenging to global leaders. Overall, we have this model, it's called uh, the, the crisis management cycle, where we think about uh, or we th where we think about crisis in a temporal perspective. So we say that crisis unfold in certain stages and steps, and these these steps need to be considered um, in crisis management and crisis management systems. So that is preparation, or prevention, preparation, response, and recovery. Right? Preparation is uh, prevention. Sorry, uh, as the first phase is a pre. Uh, pre-crisis or pre-disaster stage. And uh, prevention um, is about putting mechanisms, systems, measures in place that prevent a crisis from happening in the first place. That is politically often not very attractive um, because, you know, you would put measures in place, but you don't know if and how and in what intens intensity a crisis will ever develop. So why should you bother to invest in expensive, potentially cumbersome um, measures. Right? The German virologist Christian Drosten has just said uh, regarding or in the early stages of the pandemic that there is no glory in prevention. Right? So you cannot expect to gain, get a lot of political support or political gains out of prevention. That makes it highly unattractive. And that also contributes to the fact that we are often not as well prepared as uh, prevent, or that we do not invest as much in prevention as we maybe, as we may think we should have when crisis unfold. After pre uh, prevention comes preparation. Preparation is really that is where public agencies um, do have essentially their core competencies. That is where they where they think about what if and put all kinds of contingency plans in place. So. It can be a, play, uh, a plan for a pandemic. It can be something about um, fire protection. All kinds of plans that um, you are able to enact when uh, when a crisis hits or when you are hit by a crisis. That is requires a lot of bureaucratic planning. It requires um, an understanding of the concrete situation or policy domain um, for um, for which or sector for which a plan, um, such a plan is made. And it also requires a lot of exercise and training of the involved actors. So what we see also is that in many places, there are all kinds of nice plans on, a, on paper, but there's a lack of an organizational memory on how to enact and how to use um, these plans. So we need more exercise. I think that is also one of the lessons that we can already draw from the current crisis. 
But then what, of course, uh, uh, happens when you are prepared but still hit by the crisis, right? That is the response, what we call um, a response phase. And that is the, what is also called the within stage of the crisis or the disaster. That is very much the acute crisis response. So what to do when you're hit, how to coordinate um, action, how to develop a policy response. That is the most, um, I think, the most complex of the three, that is the situation, or that is the phase um, in of the crisis management cycle, where you really are confronted with the uncertainty, the lack of knowledge, the time pressure, the urgency, where you really have to make quick decisions, where the overall crisis management system is under high stress, and that is essentially what we are seeing right now um, with regard to the Corona um, pandemic. After the Crisis uh, response phase comes recovery, and recovery, as the name says, of course, includes getting back to normal life or to normal uh, normal procedures, um, trying to sort of healing or reconstruct the damage if possible. And it's also, and that is the more political part of it, um, also involves a lot of often political review court review, investigation of the crisis management um, system that had been enacted. Was it appropriate? Did it work? Fine. Do we need to change? Do we th need to think about reforms? Um, was the crisis management successful? That is uh, one of the major political questions, at least, that dominates the recovery phase. To respond um, to a crisis, um, a certain um, a number of steps are relevant and required. So first, you need to understand and make sense of crisis. You need to understand what goes on. You need to find your experts. You need to interpret um, the data. You need analytical capacity to, to, yeah, to understand what goes on and to base your policy and your decisions on. Because then, secondly, decision-making is the next step that is crucial, that is difficult politically, of course, because of high uncertainty, Often also because of a considerable level of contestation, you need to find a way to somehow muddling through in a way, develop a policy that you and a, and a guideline for the policy that you gain support for. And you need to do this swiftly, promptly, and uh, under high uncertainty. And that can look very different depending on the type of crisis um, you are talking about and the type of disaster that has hit. But what all crisis management systems or crisis management responses have in common is that they are actually major coordination problems. And each and any crisis, you need coordination and you need each and any policy response needs coordination of different actors, very often across levels of government, for example, um, in federal systems, but also in central systems, often between the national level and the local level. For example, so you and you need often the government needs to coordinate with a considerable number of societal actors or of other actors close to or outside the government, but definitely with a high number of actors in a very short period of time. Within the government, you also need coordination. You need coordination between the head of government that is usually. Uh, involved between the head of government and the different sectors that are involved in the crisis, so different ministries, for example, they need to coordinate with the implementing agencies, and this all needs to be then be coordinated with the wider system in which the crisis unfolds. So think about the complex coordination that is now going on and that we can see in the health systems in essentially every every um, country. We have the heads of governments, we have the respective ministers, we have the agencies, we have the doctors, we have the hospitals, we have the experts. All this needs to be coordinated. And very essentially, you can distinguish between two types of um, crisis coordination uh, or two types of or how to organize crisis coordination. Many, many people argue that centralization is the preferred approach to organize a crisis a centralized crisis management allows you to put to establish hierarchy as the core governance mechanisms, and it allows you that is at least the idea of hierarchy or of a centralized system that you have one actor on the top and that is in full control of the overall situation and of all actors that are involved. 
However, and many people think that centralization responds best to urgency and uncertainty. You control, you try to get as much control as possible, and that is what you do. Centralization and hierarchy. However, you would also find other um, authors or observers saying, well, let's rather think about crisis management as a decentralized system. We often have, the, we have this, for example, in many federal systems as well, where we have a decentralized crisis system, crisis management system. And what is the advantage here? The advantage is, of course, that it allows us to find solutions or implementation, the implementation of solutions that are very close to the local circumstances and the local situation. And then also, is, uh, decentralized systems are better able or find it easier, uh, at least, to integrate different views and different perspectives and different sets of actors at the same time. And so you can discuss it, but centralization is often what's, what people call for in situation of crisis. I'm not convinced that this is the always best and perfect solution. Um, I rather think what is, what, is, what is key here is that the crisis management somehow fits the institutional system of political system, that it fits the political and administrative culture and traditions that are in place, that it fits established state society relations. And that can be, the, this overall constellation can be very different in different countries and can also then make centralized uh, responses more appropriate and in some systems and decentralized. So, uh, responses and others. So there is no silver bullet to the solution of coordination problems. You still have coordination. Uh, you still have coordination work to do, no matter if you centralize or if you decentralize. And you always have interfaces, and you always struggle with advantages and disadvantages. I think this is very important um, to have in mind. And when we look at, for example, the current crisis, but you can also, uh, that can also be applied to other types of crisis or disasters, is of course that you have coordination on at least three levels. You need political coordination. So the political top needs to gain support for their preferred uh, crisis response among, for example, within the government coalition, always in the federal system, for example. So they need to coordinate at the highest political level and find support. Secondly, you need the coordination of strategy. What do we really do? Whom do we get uh, involved? What are the ministers to turn to? What are the public, uh, public agencies to be involved? What are the core problems we need to address in very many different respects? So the coordination of strategy is important. And then thirdly, uh, at least also as important is the coordination of the implementation. You need organizational structures in place that coordinate you with the concrete implementation of your policy response. That is why we see all these task forces, right, that try to make sense of what goes on and try to realize and implement um, all the measures that have been um, that have been taken. And they are often also um, written down in. Um, contingency, contingency plans or protocols. So you need the coordination of the concrete um, policy response that is very um, important to get your response to the ground, as we say, right? Okay, so when we think about the crisis management of the current pandemic, um, I think what we, we see all these steps here that we've, uh, that we talked about um, in the last, in the, over the uh, last uh, couple of minutes, um, actually. So we need to, um, or what the pandemic uh, tells us about crisis management, the first is that it's essential to understand the situation, that it's essential to draw um, to the experts, that it's essential to that the government, that governments respond to it and that governments take responsibility and take action, that they coordinate with the experts, but that they also try to include a variety of multiple perspectives and try to address um, the crisis and, and how it unfolds on different levels and in different respects. I think what we can also see from this crisis is that there is not one way of great crisis management. That we see countries that are, that for now at least, uh, we consider more successful than others, but they have different crisis management systems in place. 
And what is important is, I think, that to be aware of that first in times of crisis, that all attention is sort of spot on on the government. Government needs to respond, but they need to do it in a way that fits the institutionalized expectations um, and the institutionalized procedures and operations of their administrative and political systems. That is most important. I think that is also the basis on which they will be evaluated later on. Thank you.